Willkommen Leute im Stream beim Divok. The Anthropocene is now. It is our age in which we humans have become the dominant geological factor. It's an age with several different, maybe independent, environmental crises. And Theodore is a PhD microbiologist and computer scientist and will take a closer look for us and pick all these crises apart for us. Are these crises actually tied together? How much impact does each of those crises have? What does what do some of the solutions look like? And which of those have no solution? So without further ado, which of those crises are just problematic, only catastrophic, and which are just apocalyptic? Hi everybody, good to have you. I'm Theo and I'm pre-recording this talk uh, from our book where I'm doing my PhD as a bioinformatician and I'm working on the ecology of microbes in lakes. As I'm pre-recording this, I'm really looking forward to the conference that we're having right now when you're watching this or that we had when you're watching this after the fact. I'm really looking forward to the conference and I really want to thank the organizers for putting together something under this banner where we can talk about all the problems we are facing with the environmental crisis. Um, so if you see any jump cuts here, that's because I cut out some of the errors I made during the recording of it. My talk will be about problems and solving problems, but not really in the way that you might think about. And um, you might be disappointed when you think that I'm really giving you some solutions. Um, it will be not really scientific, as in hard science, natural science, and it will not be really political in a sense of what can we do politically, but it still will be both of them. And also, I will cut some corners. I will make some arguments, leave out some details, uh, which you will see, I think, um, just to make my argument. So to start, let me tell you that when I started to study, I studied biology. And only after quite a while, I started to get into contact with computer science and programmers. And I was very uh, interested, it was really strange, to see how programmers talk about problems a little bit differently. So I think that like regular people, they think about problems as something that you can just solve and then it's gone and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. But programmers, I found, when you bring them a problem, and I'm, I think I'm talking about algorithmics people here, they don't really think, okay, now how can we solve this? What's the answer to the problem that you pose to me? But they rather think, can we solve this in limited time? Is this binomial. So the question is rather, you give me a problem, can I give you an answer for every possible set of inputs uh, in reasonable time? And then they go through it, they formalize the problem, they maybe simplify it in some uh, places, they find bugs in their thinking or in their code, and they might sometimes be surprised. So, so the nicest pieces of algorithms are full of interesting surprises. And then maybe they start to work on something that regular people would call a solution. But sometimes it's fun enough to be theoretically uh, possible to solve the problem. And then solving problems also meant something different. So you when you solve problems for programmers, again, I overgeneralize, it's like chess. You know that there is a program that is able to play chess better than a human, but still you play chess. Like it's solved, but it's not solved as in 
solved, solved. So maybe let's make that dis distinction between solved as in chess and solved, solved as for regular people. And then there is this other class of problems which are not solved yet, question mark. And usually uh, programmers solve it by finding a way of mapping parts of problems onto solved problems. And this way then the problem is solved. So the main thing for this conference, which I'm very happy that uh, a conference like this happens uh, right now, especially, is that we really have to solve the environmental crisis. And I don't know whether environmental crisis is the right term. Um, it's really hard for me to think about what the right term for this might be. But, you know, we have all of these different issues or problems uh, which come together to one big whole, which for now I would call environmental crisis. So what I suggest for this talk is that we go through some of these details of the environmental crisis and take this idea of solving problems from a programmer's point of view and uh, apply it very aggressively. And let's see where it gets us. So as a first example, let's take climate change. And I really don't need to go into any of the details. You know everything about it, I think, because it's really um, a topic that we talk a lot about. And you know also this uh, figure that is the warning stripes that shows you how the medium temperature is rising very strongly in the last few decades. If we think about now what the problem is with climate change, then we might formalize it like this. We need to minimize the delta of temperature, the increase of, of uh, medium temperature uh, of the whole Earth. So there should be no more uh, climate change in terms of temperature. And then we can uh, take this problem and think about it, go to some scientists, ask them, climate scientists, for example, what, uh, ask them what they can say about it. And they will say, look, we have all of these models. We have all of this data. We can easily tell you that the, at the core of the problem, there is CO2 and equivalence of CO2. So that's CO2E. And then the problem is solved. Of course, then the work begins, and that's the work that we're in right now as a society or in this conference to figure out how to minimize uh, CO2e. But let's say, as a naive scientist, for me, this problem is solved, and I really don't understand why it's not solved, solved yet. There is a second example that's very close to this, uh, and actually something that we have solved, solved, more or less, and that's the ozone depletion. Here we can formalize it, like minimize the reduction of ozone in the ozone layer. And again, going to scientists and so on, we found out that you have to minimize the emissions of certain chemicals um, into the atmosphere. And that way, the ozone depletion um, was solved, solved. Again, more or less, but let's say it's solved, solved. If we now take a third example, Let's take species extinctions. So you know that um, in the last decades, more and more species go extinct. And this is um, getting closer and closer to a level where ecosystems will collapse if we don't do anything about it. There are a lot of problems involved in this. And I don't want to go into those details, but I want to think about how to formalize this. And again, as a starting point, we might say, okay, we need to minimize the number of extinctions to a minimum level, best case zero. No more species should go extinct because of uh, anthropogenic impact. So if we take this and go to scientists with this, ecologists and so on, they will not be able to give you uh, a good model for that because it's really hard. Um, ecosystems are complex systems and there is not just one system like the climate system that's one global system but there are many different ecosystems all over the place and it's hard and it's really no surprise then to see that there are a lot of reasons different reasons for extinctions that don't overlap some of them do and you could go at them 
but it's not as easy as climate change. So if we encounter a problem like this in programming, one of the things we might think about is, do we think about the problem in the wrong way? Do we need to zoom in, maybe? Do we need to zoom out? And the bigger picture is called Anthropocene, and that's the geological period where humans or humanity or we have changed the face of the earth to such a degree that it's causing significant changes. We are approaching a lot of tipping points in all of the environmental systems that are out there. Also, the Anthropocene has started only around 1950 because that's where we see in all of these variables that are here in these great acceleration graphs a strong increase, hockey stick-like, in many different variables, both on a societal side or anthropogenic side, as well as in the Earth systems. And it really looks like a switch got flipped and all the dynamics are different. And that's what the Anthropocene is, in essence, is that the Earth system has entered into a new dynamic, which does not bode well, actually, for us. How can we think about this in the terms that we know before as problems? And when we try to think about what we should minimize in the Anthropocene, we will not find something to do. And we can really think a lot about it. And many people have done. And some of them have come up with good ideas. Some of them have come up with bad ideas. Uh, some of them actually have thought about the Anthropocene as a problem. And their solution is to just fly away and uh, live on Mars or something like that. So maybe what we need to do here is to abandon the idea that this is a problem and to think about it differently. So I want to suggest a different class of problem or issue or something. Um, and all of this nomenclature is a little bit problematic. So let's call the other thing that is not a problem a catastrophe. And let's define it like this. So problems on the one hand can be solved and then they go away that's like problem, solution, everything's fine. And by that, they are external. They don't really belong to you in, a, in any uh, form of identity. Catastrophes, on the other hand, they don't go away. You have to learn to live with this new situation that came about with catastrophe. And in this way, they are internal to you, in a sense. This leads to something that will come up later that for catastrophes, problem solving might be, and I would argue, is a dark pattern. So by catastrophe, I mean something more or less specific, and I cannot really define it more than that. So I will give you some examples, and then hopefully uh, you can understand what I mean. So for example, let's say you lose a leg or an arm in any sort of uh, accident. Losing an arm or a leg is not really a problem. You cannot solve it. Of course, you can get some sort of mechanical technological replacement, but it will not solve the problem. You still have lost your arm or your leg. You will, even with this uh, help, you will have to learn how to live with your new situation. So this is a catastrophe. But catastrophes the, the name sounds really apocalyptic. So another example would be maybe falling in love and like the big way um, of not being able to sleep, not being able to eat and so on. Um, something that really changes everything and it does not go away easily. In some movies, you know, uh, there are these situations where a character comes up and says, you know, I have fallen in love. What can I do? And the other person says, yeah, just wait, it will go away. But this is not how to handle love. It is not a problem. It cannot be solved. It is a catastrophe. You have to learn to live with this uh, change. But it's, of course, not apocalyptic. And falling in love not always means the end of the world. Maybe if we want to have a motto of how to cope with catastrophes, it is this title of a Donna Haraway book, Staying with the Trouble. Not run away with it, stay with the trouble, live with the trouble, accept the trouble as a new form of identity, maybe. 
sadly the book is not really about this uh, it is not a bad book but it's really not about this but i really like the title and i had to include it here so as i said i think problems might be a dark pattern and we tend to focus on problems instead of catastrophes so for example in the political discourse we're talking a lot about climate change and we're not talking too much about either uh, species extinctions which we are talking about but still not that uh, that much and we're really not talking enough about the anthropocene so why is that the case and i have two ideas that i want to present to you and you can disagree with me and you can come up with your own ideas but i think there is something here um, why problems are so attractive to us and i think one is uh, narratives so you know for example in godzilla films and i think they're really a good example here you have a problem and that is a monster arrives either godzilla or some other kaiju uh, that just shows up and destroys everything and this is a problem and solving the problem is to make this go away or wait until it goes away or support the right kaiju so that all of them go away and then the problem is solved however in all of these movies there are countless catastrophes people lose their homes people lose their loved ones but the movie is not about them and the movie cannot be about them because the movie has to end and by the end of the movie the problem has to be solved that's one of the uh, most unrealistic things about movies in general they end uh, the real life does not really end with the end of the problem but a movie does end right after the problem is solved so maybe we should think about how to have narratives that don't end when the problem is solved and i know that for example in in old scripture and so on there are many narratives that just don't end when the problem is solved but these narratives stick with you and um, you take them with you in your life maybe this is one of the reasons why we like problems so much because they make really entertaining narratives but i think there is a second reason and that is with problems you can sell stuff that solves the problems so um, solutions as a service coding solutions whatever solutions if someone has a problem you can sell them an app that will solve their problem or you can try and sell them i don't know blockchain that will solve their pandemic or something like that as long as someone has a problem you can sell them stuff that will solve that it's much harder to sell something that helps people to live with their catastrophes I know there are also things like that. There are actually apps that do that, but um, it's easier to sell solutions uh, as a service. So the Anthropocene is not a problem, but a catastrophe. It is a catastrophe in which humanity or humans or us have become a natural power. Uh, a natural disaster you might say but it is here and it is here to stay so how to live with it now would be the question and sadly i cannot really tell you how to do that but we should not fall into the trap of being sold something that will just make the anthropocene go away and i think very broadly speaking there are two sides to this. The one is the techno-optimist solutionist side that will just uh, require us some new techniques, some new progress, and this new progress, this new machine will then make everything fine. This will not be possible for the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene will require us to change as humanity, as humans, um, to adopt to a way of living in accordance with this catastrophe but the other way of mistreating this catastrophe is to be too optimistic in a sense of well we can still go back of being techno pessimist 
of um, saying that we should just try and go back to a way of living um, before the Anthropocene and then everything will be fine. No, this is a catastrophe. This will stay here. We have to learn to live with it. We have to deal with it. And this excludes both of these ways of mistreating a catastrophe like a problem. We now have to think about this, and this is a political uh, job and also a job for almost all disciplines of science of thinking about how we can do that. In this way, the Anthropocene is really, really scary for me as a scientist, as a biologist, or as a programmer, or whatever, because as a scientist, I really like to have all the disciplines clean, separated, to know what I am studying and someone else is studying something else. Um, but here, everything comes together, and we need to combine the views of Earth, Earth system scientists, geologists, biologists, uh, climate scientists, what have you, with political scientists, sociologists, and so on and so on. We need to think about narratives. We need to think about how we think about ourselves. So I know that I might disappoint you here, but the only thing I have left for you are some theses. And the main thing is that we have to learn to live with the Anthropocene, in the Anthropocene, without destroying everything. We have to come to a place where humanity and our environment is able to live on uh, in this catastrophical world. One thing that we need to do towards this goal is to identify as many sub-problems of the catastrophe as possible and also solve them and also solve, solve them. Again, it's not really understandable why climate change is not something that is being solved, solved right now, but still so many things are holding us back. But then on the other hand, we should not turn catastrophes into problems. We should not mistreat catastrophes. We ha also have to identify catastrophes as such and uh, act towards them as such. Another of my uh, theses is that for a humane Anthropocene, we need to create a humane humanity. This is a point where uh, social issues and environment, environmental issues um, overlap and we cannot um, live with the environment in a way that does not turn this catastrophe into an apocalypse if we mistreat uh, humanity like we do now. And I think that this has something to do with capitalism, but I just want to leave it like that. It would need a really deep dialectical Marxist analysis to do that in the context of the Anthropocene. And I cannot do it here in this talk, and I cannot do it as a biologist. And with that, I want to introduce you to Niels Richter, who discussed with me through all of these details and who was instrumental to this talk. Without him, this would not have happened. If you want this uh, analysis of capitalism in the context of Anthropocene, maybe you should uh, talk to him on Twitter or something like that. And then I want to thank you. I want to really give a big thanks to the organizers uh, who set up this conference and I'm really happy now to take your questions. And actually, it's not really now, right? It's in a week. I'm pre-recording this, so I don't know. Uh, but if you have any more questions after this, uh, write me on Twitter or something and see you. Yeah, thank you, Theodor. Thank you for this nice talk. Thank you, Theodore, for this nice talk. Um, yeah, should we go to Q&A right away? So there are a few questions in the pad from the audience. And the first question I want to pose to you, uh, what is the difference between the Anthropocene age and other ages which are named after what humans did? Um, so I don't really know what the 
question asker means. So maybe here she refers to like cultural ages, but this is a geological age. So this is like the Jurassic or the Perm or something like that, which is not a not all of the other geological or rather geological ages are defined by geology. So what you need to do is you go, need to go out and uh, find a place of Earth where you can really see uh, in the in the like order of soils or of ground. Uh, you you need to see a certain strata, a certain place where something changes significantly. So, for example, at the end of the age of the dinosaurs, there was a change in the geological um, age because a giant meteorite hit Earth, and uh, you could see that all of the all of the Earth. And similarly, now we can see in geology changes um, that are made by humans. And the one thing that um, science seems to focus in on is um, um, nuclear, how do you say that? Could you help me? Like a nuclear... The nuclear age or the nuclear no, it's, uh, it's, wars? No, what you can see testing, in the ground is that there is... Yeah, you can see the, the effects of nuclear testing and nuclear bombs around 1950. And this is something mm -hmm. you can measure and will be able to measure in centuries to come. So in contrast to, for example, the Bronze Age, where you can say, look, some people there have uh, found something new. This is really connected to the Earth as a planet. Mm -hmm. And also it's uh, global. So cultural ages mm -hmm. uh, happen at different time places of Earth differently. So some groups of people go through the Bronze Age, for example, quicker than others. So I, I assume this also answers the question why the Anthropocene starts in 1950, because it's due to the uh, measurements of, of global of nuclear testing. So, so actually there is a huge amount of discussion about this and there are like four different places where the Anthropocene could start. It could start with people um, uh, starting agriculture, like way back. Mm -hmm. It could start uh, with the beginning of the industrialization. This would be 19, uh, 1850 or something. It could start with um, when Europeans started to um, spread in North America, because there are also some geological things happening there. But uh, 1950, because of the t atomic testing and of these um, great acceleration graphs that I showed in my mm -hmm. in my talk. This is the date where all of the evidence comes together. So it's really not uh, driven by discussion, but scientists looking at the data and saying, <laughs> really being surprised that a new epoch has begun around 1950, which is strange. I mean, my grandma was alive in the last one, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the audio is gone. Can you check? Ah, yeah, that's better. So yeah, I can I can just imagine as a scientist, you just look at these graphs. You need to you see to want to check out the, the areas, and you're like, oh my god, this it's 1950, and and we did that, we did that, yeah? and and we just put our fingers on Mother Earth and left a mark. And usually so, as a natural scientist, so to say, um, or mm -hmm. exact science or whatever, you don't really think about humans, right? I mean, as a biologist, right, yeah. as a microbiologist, I really care nothing about humans. And I really don't think about what humans or what I do to my study object. There is always a a distinction between me as a researcher and my study object. And this just breaks down <clears throat> in the Anthropocene, which is even mind boggling. Yes, it's like the, the subject is being influenced by the measurements um, 
but we are measuring ourselves now. So why, why do you think, did we manage to solve the, the ozone hole issue in a relatively short time? So after discovering FCK way and, and then banning it, and uh, it's still in the process of being solved, but being better. But why are we struggling to do anything meaningful about climate change for decades now? So we're talking about for decades, but really, it feels like nothing has, has happened, nothing meaningful. Yeah, so I don't, I don't think that I'm the best person to ask this because I don't know. I can just imagine. And I think one of the things is that it's easier to ban this class of chemicals than to ban CO2 emissions. CO2 emissions play in... <laughs> almost every um, process and uh, carbofluorin, I don't know how to pronounce them, this, this class of chemicals that um, causes the ozone hole that sounds easier to ban on a, uh, on a political level, but I don't really know. So what you would need to look into would be, of course, the dynamics, like the political dynamics at the time so what mm. happened? Were there huge demonstrations about this or not? And so on. Yeah, may maybe it was an issue, one more of, it's an easy problem to solve, just, just one problem versus uh, a bunch of problems that make up a catastrophe or, or some, something that happens gradually, constantly, and it's just background noise to many people. Also, those processes that create CO2 emissions, they feel natural in mm. contrast to this chemical. You know, this ugly chemical, we shouldn't really use this chemical that feels artificial and evil, but uh, everything almost, all, uh, all processes uh, produce CO2 and it just doesn't feel bad. It, feels like in our everyday life driving a car doesn't feel like you're destroying uh, earth but I, again i don't know this is all conjecture yeah of course but uh that's what we're here for thinking about it <laughs> as everybody should so i think there's another question and i think it's, it's a good follow-up um, we as humans love to solve problems so how do we stop starting catastrophes? Should we just think ahead more or is there some kind of technique that we should teach in school? <clears throat> oh, can you repeat that? This is really okay. interesting. <laughs> so yeah, so we as humans, we just love to solve problems. Uh, but, but how do we teach ourselves to, to stop starting catastrophes? So how, how do we, how are we, how, how can we be more uh, forward looking of, of the impact we are having? So, so at first, I don't know, I don't know why I got darker now. I don't know what happened, but um, I don't know if whether we as humans are so interested in solving problems, you know, um, we should always be very careful when saying something about humanity. It might just be that uh, I don't, I don't want to assume uh, anything, but maybe people that work with computers really like solving problems. Um, I can imagine that many people really hate problems <laughs> and solving them. They just want to be left alone, and that's fine, right? Yeah, you could um, be right. So, <laughs> but the other part is how do we uh, make? How will we be able to? have no further catastrophes take place. And if we follow what I said about catastrophes, I don't even know whether that's possible because that's just living life is getting into problems and also into situations which are um, which are catastrophes in, in my sense. So I don't know whether we can really, it sounds too easy to say we can just do this and this and then we'll never get into any catastrophes again. I think that's 
something that we need to take seriously as part of living mm -hmm. uh, that we will cause catastrophes in my sense again okay. not apocalypse but like every day like the problems that you have with your neighbor or something like that that just takes place because you want to i don't know <laughs> Yeah, you but can but surely, like but surely we can we can do something to uh, head off problems or uh, I mean more humans, more technology uh, gives us a, a larger level to impact the world. So maybe we also need uh, more far sides to look what's on the other end of that lever. I mean, and foresight. I, I think it needs to be taught. Maybe. <clears throat> I mean, of course, foresight would be helpful as well as understanding what uh how the the other functions right for example you can uh you can have a heavy uh, a happy life with your neighbor if you know what he or she or they dislike or like and then you can manage um but it will always be managing it will not be you know printing out a piece of paper saying mm -hmm. dear neighbor i will not get to, into your in in problems with you and then it's solved and of course, that means not only uh, that means knowing more about nature or whatever um, and how that functions. But it always will be, you know, like this idea that my freedom ends at that point where mm -hmm. I start to inhibit the freedom of others. That's more or less the thing. And this boundary is not fixed. It always needs to be figured out every day again. And I think something like this, there is the point of catastrophe in this figuring out how far you can go. It will be a process, mm. though. It always is. So you said that uh, CO2 is solved, but not solved solved, um, which is kind of weird. But what, what are the obvious solutions? So... Um, this is one of the corners I cut because I don't want to go into all the things that you can do. But also, I think they are just obvious. I think we have like uh, Fridays for Future started around two years ago and everything they say is like true. So, so it should be obvious and I should not need to uh, repeat it, you know? I mean, mm. obvious. it's obvious you, we need to cut or replace all processes that produce CO2, all of them. And then all okay. the details that follow, that's hard. That's like really hard. And all the politics that is involved is especially hard. Okay, so pointer to Fridays for Futures, go look at what they're doing, go what they're saying and, yeah, of and course. let's help. Yeah. And I think this is also an interesting question. Like, um, Maybe it, it uh, is representative of what, what many people on, on the world, in the world are thinking. Can't we just run away from this problem? I mean, what if we do nothing? Can we just go to Mars or maybe it will solve itself or maybe it will solve us by making us go away? I mean, uh, if you look into history or how you cope with other catastrophes, sometimes it's a good idea to start worshipping some <clears throat> sort of idol and this way you can resolve your problem with, with stuff. <laughs> That's a possibility. But um, but we have decided to, to solve, solve it, more or less. And uh, we believe that science is the way to do that. And then politics, of course. So So that's a different... We cannot really... Like running away is like starting to pray to an idol. We the, mm. the, the catastrophe will follow us, of course. I mean that's how how can you if you can promise me that we will not do the same to Mars that we will do to Earth, and if you can promise me that there will not be too much uh, like people dying or people left behind on Earth or mm. something like that, I might be able to to agree, but I don't believe that. Yeah, maybe we need to uh, do the opposite first because Mars isn't really habitable. So, uh, so rather than not destroying Earth, we first would have to learn how to make another planet habitable. Which is uh, yeah, maybe a good exercise. <laughs> <laughs> and from a technical point of view, this might look like the same problem, right? 
Yes, absolutely. But is it? <laughs> I don't know. I really don't. I mean, I, I guess people might argue that uh, if we can ever bring back a planet back to life like Mars, then uh, we can easily destroy ours and, and reverse it somewhere. But the problem, of course, is where are we going to be living in the meantime? Because even for Mars, it's going to take uh, like hundreds of thousands of years. Also, that's... Uh, this view of going to Mars is in a very bad way anthropocentric. Like, <laughs> oh yes, yes it is. I mean, we we would need to take some of these things with us, but it's uh, it's the idea that we can go to Mars without taking almost any everything uh, living here with us. I mean, we could start making a list, right? We would need some yeah. some trees, we would need some bushes, we would need the animals that feed on the trees, we would need all of the bacteria and archaea that as a microbiologist I love so much and I understand that we need them. So um, prepare your big aquaria full of living organisms that we take with us to Mars. Would be just more economical to stay here, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question that just came in um, wouldn't it be I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here uh, wouldn't it be great if we could um, change the meaning of the Anthropocene into something positive like make it deserve its name by making the world better and not destroying our living space I hope that's, that's what the, the, uh, the person asking the question meant yeah, that's that's a good uh, idea. I mean, that would be um, that would be solving the catastrophe, you know. That would be uh, turning a catastrophe into something positive by uh, staying true to the name and saying, mm -hmm. you know, humans with the Anthropocene, you always have the problem that it sounds like humans are parasites are. It, and it's necessary for them to be like that, you know? Mm -hmm. If you have the Anthropocene as the age of humans, of course humans destroy everything. How can they be otherwise? But we know that we can be theoretically well-meaning be, well at least, and uh, we can make beautiful things out of uh, dirt. And right now we make dirt out of beautiful things. Um, so that mm -hmm. would be like the the only way of really going at it, of really solving the um, catastrophe, is to turn the whole thing into a positive, let's say like that. And then of yeah. course the questions begin what that entails. So what is it that right now turns us into destroyers of Earth? Um, and it should not be you know, it would be an easy way out of saying, yeah, it's just human nature. That's, mm -hmm. I don't believe that. That's, that cannot be, I mean, then everything is over uh, and it has been over from the very beginning. And we, we, we know so, that it doesn't mean need mm -hmm. to be like that. Sorry. <laughs> so, so what do you think is holding us back? Um, I cannot say too much about it. I really need to think about that. Uh, it would be too easy for me to just say, you know, capitalism, zack, that's it. <laughs> um, yeah. But there is something in us or among us or in the way that we organize ourselves that goes against our very interest to survive on this planet. And we need good, good analysis what this is. And my feeling would be that it is the idea of turning everything into commodities and mm -hmm. buying everything and then uh, turning everything into into waste products at the end. Mm -hmm. But again, you <laughs> really should not quote me on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it sounds like a great start. I mean, we have to start somewhere. We, we can only solve um, catastrophes iteratively. It, so step by step, I guess. And um, yeah, when we start one thing and see it helps, we can stick with it. And then when we see the next uh, thing we could improve, we do that and then we do that. At least. Yeah, I mean, it, is, 
it is a question of relation, right? It's the question of how do humans, humanity, we, whatever, relate to the outside environment, nature. All these terms need to be defined finer, I guess. And um, right now, this relationship is defined by material relations, uh, and relations of power. Um, mm -hmm. So it's something somewhere in that direction. But let's let's talk about that in I don't know next year. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then um, yeah, we will see each other again at uh, fifteen twenty at the talk. Where did Rapid Venture selbst betreiben? Ein Serviervorschlag.